Good evening, folks. It's Diamond with the Oppenheimer Ranch Project, Magnetic Reversal News, and Shinrin Yoku, bringing you a Grand Solar Minimum update, Wednesday, January 12th, 9 p.m. Mountain Time, 2022. The models are being crunched, and the newest model won't come out for an hour, but the snow is certainly a big story. Winter Storm Izzy, and it has been named... And that's the big story. A winter storm will swing through the east. Does Atlanta get snow? Nashville? Washington? Well, according to the experts, it's still up in the air. Keep calm. It's boom time. <laughs> Eastern U.S. on alert for a thumping from another winter storm. And they just can't keep up with these models. Potential coastal storm developing, which we have started reporting on up to two days ago. Now we're looking for snow from Memphis all the way up to... Maine, it's insane. But the major storm is going to drop down here through Iowa, like we said days ago. And we're going to get to the models in just a se second. As winter storm Izzy to spread snow and ice from the Midwest to the South and the East during Martin Luther King weekend. Now here's where it's going to start. The winter weather alerts. We have winter storm watches from North Dakota, South Dakota, say it ain't soda, all the way down into Iowa. So heads up, Des Moines, you are in the crosshairs for the most snow for your state. Looking at maybe 8 to 10 inches in Des Moines, but this snow is going to continue to develop on Friday with an ice storm in Omaha, maybe a mix, and it's going to drop down towards St. Louis, and then that's boom time. Nashville, Fort Smith could be picking up a very strange cacophony of uh, weather anomalies, including rain, sleet. Maybe some thunder booms and some thunder snow because behind all this is the cold air and we'll bomb out. And well, the models are just not lining up. And we'll show you what we mean in a moment. Mixed precipitation and flooding threatens the Northwest. Eyes on the winter storm from the plains to the East Coast. Heavy rainfall will continue to bring flooding and landslide risks to Washington State. Winter storm watches uh, flooding risks and warnings there up on the uh, peninsula, especially in the northwest portion of the state. So click on a county if you're worried about what's happening in the region. Now, a Canadian storm system is expected to bring accumulating snowfall to the northern plains Thursday night into Friday. The winter storm system is expected to impact the mid-south and southeast over the weekend, like we said, and we're going to walk you through the current model. Now, this isn't the most recent model. It's still crashing the numbers, but we're not going to get far enough into the model to give you uh, these snow totals that are showing up here on Sunday and Monday. In case you didn't know, the models come out every six hours, but in the beginning, they're only showing you the first few hours of the model, and it takes, well, it takes time to get the full model. So this is the 18Z run on January 12th, which is the 6 p.m. model, which is now two hours old, completely finished. So this is the best we can do up to date now, but what you're looking at is a, a heavy system, and heavy snow is going to be dumping in at least 14 states over the next five days. So tonight and tomorrow, here's your Friday, Thursday night into Friday, you're going to see that storm starting to jam in on uh, North Dakota, South Dakota, Minnesota, say it ain't soda, and then down into Iowa where the center of the state is going to pick up most of the snow, potential for up to 14 inches in some areas. And that's going to continue to move south through misery. And the triple junction here of Kentucky, Tennessee, and misery is looking like one of the bullseyes. The second bullseye is western North Carolina, western Virginia, and eastern West Virginia. Those are the big bullseyes for the main event. And that's what's been consistent over the last four days. Heavy snow in this region, the Blue Ridge Parkway, and now west of there towards the Appalachian. So Blue Ridge region west of the Appalachian Spine could be picking up 18 to 20 inches in some areas, as well as the high mountains of West Virginia and the Appalachians and eastern West Virginia looking at 14 to 16 inches. We could also be looking at 14 to 16 inches for that triple junction region. I don't think most of Kentucky is going to get this much snow, but certainly western Kentucky, a little portion of northwestern Tennessee, and a little portion of southeastern misery, as well as northeastern Arkansas. So big, heavy snow system here. We're going to see some record totals. Another system is following that back up. Could be bringing some snow way to the south. Hello! Late in the model. But what we're certainly looking for in the next four or five days is a significant event on the East Coast, the Midwest, 
the upper Midwest, well, they all need it. This is the snow hole. And there still seems to be a little snow hole in Indiana. We're really sorry, folks. Customers are furious after energy supplier tells customers to cuddle pets to keep warm. <laughs> this is in the UK. Hey, hey. Thank God we don't live there. A British energy supplier has apologized for the poorly judged and unhelpful advice it sent to customers, which suggested they could snuggle up to their pets and exercise to cut back on their heating bills. <laughs> this is a sign of things to come. This is not an aberration. This is the beginning of a new paradigm, and it's called extreme cold and ice. Here we're looking at the Arctic ice extent, some of the highest it's been in decades. 20-year highs in the Arctic ice area as well at the same position, about to eclipse all the data sets that they pinched down the whole data set to even show to prove their global warming narrative. Now we're peaking out above all of it, and it's actually backfired. I'll tell you what didn't backfire. Total snow mass for the Northern Hemisphere. It's now three weeks earlier than the multi-decadal average going back to the early 1980s. Yeah, we have as much snow in the Northern Hemisphere as we used to do 40 years ago. Hello! More snow than 40 years ago. Shut up, Al! Get in your hole! I knew I'd rile him up with that data point. Jesus. Seismic update. No quakes of note. Thankfully. But we are now entering... Well, a time of potential booms. And what I mean is, wait for it. Apologize for the phone call. Luckily, it was Rex Bear. Now, what we're looking for here is a war uh, seismic warning for at least the next three or four days as this massive coronal hole passes through. Tomorrow, it's going to be almost uh, completely earth-facing. And so we're, the next three days is really of the seismic warning we're going to be issuing. For the next 72 hours, we'll be seeing a seismic warning. Tomorrow, the next 24 hours starting tomorrow morning, will be the main uh, seismic warning watch. So heads up there as we move through and into Solar Cycle 25. Some amazing uh, science coming up at the end of the podcast. Stay tuned. Worldwide Volcano News Update. No uh, interesting volcanic activity over the last 36 hours to report. Some interesting... Uh, New reports here at Niringongo in the Congo is the growing lava lake, which means very little and insignificant. The wolf volcanic eruption continues on Isabel Island in the Galapagos with lava flows now approaching the ocean just a few kilometers away. And you can see that huge trail there. Look at that. Just about to touch down in the seawater. And uh, one other point of note is Rapehu. Volcano, the North Island of New Zealand. A series of quakes beneath the summit area are raising some eyebrows. And this is in a heavily populated area. New Zealand, a series of tectonic quakes, 30 located beneath the summit area, have been recorded since the 30th of December. That's just two weeks. When compared to historical records, the number of earthquakes with epicenters closely confined to the summit area, this is quite unusual. Now, while these earthquakes clusters are uncommon. None of the monitoring data suggests that the volcano is exhibiting increased activity levels in other regions. There's been no observable response from other continuous monitoring data, such as Crater Lake, the temperature levels, the lake level, or volcanic tremor. Therefore, the current assessment is that a relatively deep stress release has occurred below the volcano, but this has not affected the volcano's hydrothermal system says Geonet. Now, if this means that there's a very deep uh, source of magma being in place, and I want to digress here and say that these are forming perfectly around the ring of the caldera of that volcano, and I think that they're maybe a little full of doo-doo. Now, one good thing about Rapeyu is that it is not spectacularly eruptive. The eruptive history is quite insignificant. The last significant eruption was 1996 at VEI-3. And prior to that, 1995. So all of the significant eruptions have happened recently. And I'm going way back here. Way, way back. Mostly VEI 1 and 2, all the way back to 1210 when there was a VEI 3. But we just had one. And a VEI 4 back, my goodness, 10,000 years ago. Are we repeating the 10,000-year cycle? Will there be a VEI 4? It's anyone's guess. But the current... Telemetry and the data points on the island are suggesting something is happening, something unique 
but nothing is imminent. So we're going to keep a close eye on Rapeyu, and I'm sure the scientists in New Zealand are doing the same. Pretty cool piece of science coming out from my uh, boyhood home, my old stomping ground, Northeast USA. Fish believed to be extinct in Ohio, found alive after 82 years. While why they're showing a picture of an otter is anyone's guess, but we can scroll down here to the fish in question, and there it is. Now, the fish in question is, well, does anyone know what that is? According to New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, the longhead darter, which I'm well familiar with because I used to seen them out of a creek and use them to fish with, is now known to be present in Ohio, Tennessee, New York, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Kentucky, Virginia, North Carolina. But the fish is uncommon and is considered threatened, and they just found it in Ohio, and that is a good-looking longhead darter. They're about an inch or two, not a very spectacular fish but certainly an endangered one because of the unique type of drainage it needs. It needs very rocky bottoms with gravel. And in the Northeast, it's mostly muddy and nasty, especially in drought. So it's very hard to keep these populations alive, but they're resilient nonetheless because, once again, we have some good news on a podcast. Fish believed to be extinct in Ohio, found alive after 82 years. The longhead darter. Take a look. Let's just blow him up for all of humanity. Gorgeous little minnow. Well, he's a darter. Now, we can only date humanity based on the fossils we have. And tonight, we're going to talk about Homo sapiens, you and I, hominids that are exactly the same genetics as us. How old are they? And how long have we walked on the earth? It's my position that we've been here for a very long time, millions of years. But only until recently, the fossil records only went back a few hundred thousand years. And, well, fossils that clearly foreshadow modern humans are 30,000 years older than we once thought. That's not a big time jump. But in just the last few decades, we've jumped 100,000 years back in time. And we're going to bring up the speed to how old we know Homo sapiens sapiens are. And that's you and I, humans. And a paper coming out today, age of the oldest known Homo sapien from Eastern Africa has pushed the date in Eastern Africa back to 233,000 years ago, plus or minus 22 kill years. And they did it based on volcanic eruptions and pumice layers. Because right above some of these tools, now, granted, these are there are tools in this cave 233,000 years old. That should blow your mind. And the dating they're using is quite significant. Um, and this pushes the date of hominids in Africa back 30,000 more years. It used to be 200,000, and now we're at 233,000 years here in East Africa. Now, back in 2017, a fossil find that was dated came out on the oldest Homo sapien fossils ever found. And these are from Morocco, and they date to 315,000 years ago. Exactly the same skull as you and I would have if we were buried in the backyard and the worms and nematodes ate the flesh off of it. It would look exactly the same. So people like you and I were walking around based on physical evidence. 315,000 years ago. That should blow many of your minds because many of you think the earth is only 6,000 years old. But in fact, there are three examples of early modern humans in the physical form that we have um, of the oldest Homo sapiens. And they include the Omo Kibish site in southwestern Ethiopia that we didn't talk about, but we just did now. Those are 200,000 years old. The Floresbad site in South Africa, which we just read a paper about 259,000 years ago, and the Jebel Ahud site in Morocco is now dated to 300,000 years. And that was the paper we shared here. 315,000 years, in fact. So what's going on? Well, we're about to blow your mind. You're looking at a composite of some of my famous prox uh, favorite proxy data. And this is data gleaned from things like oxygen, isotopes, dung, and dust fungi, and many other types of uh, data sets that give us these graphs. And amazingly, they all match up. 
And this is from present on the left side back 700,000 plus years. And I just want to focus on the last 330,000 years when these hominids, Homo sapiens sapiens, people, humans, just like you and I have been found as far back as 330,000 years ago. That brings us right to here. And this spike, 330,000 years ago was a Younger Dryas event. It wasn't the Younger Dryas. That was just 12,900 years ago. But these 100,000 year cycles are the major driver of major catastrophe on Earth. They could be the pole shift moment, the actual geographic pole shift moment. There's no other event that would line up with that except these spikes. And luckily, the last one just happened and won't happen for 82,000 more years. So nothing to worry about there. But just the fact that humans were alive back here and lived through a 26 degree temperature rise and then a 22 degree fall and up and down five times every 100,000 years. And again, another major cosmic catastrophe. And then five more cosmic catastrophes after that. And then again, 104,000 years, another Younger Dryas type event. And then five or six more major cosmic catastrophes. And the right there, the extinction of the Neanderthals. And then the Younger Dryas event and now our interstadial, which is this little blue line to the left here. And after all these spikes, there's a major drop-off. And, and that's exactly where we are at the major drop-off. Spike, little interstadial drop-off. Spike, little interstadial. And guess where we are, folks? Yeah, you guessed it, at the drop-off. But the fact that we can look at all these cosmic catastrophes, these major fluctuations in climate where temperature rises and falls 20 degrees C again and again, dozens of times over 300,000 years, and we're still here, <laughs> makes COVID look like a joke. Now, Professor Ehud Krimran from the Ministry of Health also thinks it's a joke, and it's time to admit failure. And this letter just came out. And it's an open letter to the world on the global management of the pandemic. And if you want to know more, join us over at Rumble in about an hour. That's a boom to knowledge. I don't want to say anything that might get us banned because it might be factual and helpful to you in actually making a critical decision. But who am I? Thanks to all of you for listening. I hope you got something out of the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't. Share this with like-minded people. Be safe. We love you. Become a Patreon. Become a hero. It's free. Just share the video. That's boom.